Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, starting in verse 1, gives something called the Sermon on the Mount. This whole gospel of Matthew portrays Jesus in mosaic fashion. For example, notice it's a Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, my argument is, is giving a new and improved law on the mountain just like the old covenant was given for Mount Sinai, but now he is doing it as the new lawgiver. M Matthew portrays Jesus in very mosaic ways, the whole gospel. Notice, even the way he writes it, he went up on the mountain. And there's other stuff. It says he opens his mouth, and then he says, blessed are, right? You see verses 3 through 10, verses 10, 11, 12. And then after he says all that, he's going to say something so people don't get the wrong idea about what he's saying. Because this is a, not about the Sermon on the Mount, I'm just giving you the context of which he says verse 17. So now we come to verse 17. Jesus says this, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. The whole debate and discussion hinges on what Jesus means by fulfill. But let me just show you a few things I find helpful. Jesus does not contrast abolish. Abolish means to like destroy, right? He doesn't contrast abolish with keep. Here's what I mean. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to keep the law. He doesn't say that, does he? That's important. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to repeat the law. He doesn't say that. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to reiterate the law. He doesn't say that. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to renew the law. Huh? What's he say? I didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. That's the contrast. Because law keepers will say, open up your Bible to Matthew 5, 17. You want to be like Jesus? Jesus kept the law. But that's not what Jesus said, though. Hmm. You want to be like Jesus? Do what Jesus did. So I get to die on the cross, too. I got to turn over the, t the money t changers. And this, I'm got to do this, right? You know, it's like a, it's like a little trick there. I got to exist eternally? What? <laughs> you know? Okay, now let's find out what destroy means or abolish. It's a verb there, katalusai, katalusai. Tear down, disassemble, render invalid. These are the lexical definitions that you'll see given. What he's saying, though, by that is the key. This is a, what's sometimes called a new covenant look at this. There's something called new covenant theology, and it's a whole thing, but this is a specific way to describe it I find helpful. He will not destroy its intent, meaning what the law is intended for. He's not destroying that. Jesus's words are not going to make the law fail in its design. That's why it's important to understand its design. All this may be leading you to a question. Well, if that's true, why did God give the law? Now, there's a lot of reasons, but I'm going to show you just a few. First of all, people need to be regulated. They need to know what the standard is for right and wrong, according to God's standard. If there's a judge, he needs to give a law, and God did. But it has another function, or two, or three, or four. Let's talk about some of the functions here in Galatians chapter 3. So Galatians, written around 65 or so, early-ish in the Christian movement, by the Apostle Paul. And at Galatians, in these churches in those regions, there's people coming in trying to push the law. Theologians call them Judaizers because they were trying to push Judaism on the Christians. And Judaism and Christianity are two different religions. One has Jesus, one doesn't. You know? So a lot of these law pushers that you'll meet in your life, they don't like the book of Galatians. In fact, I ran into one the other day, they said, I'm going to read a verse from Max. I'm going to read a verse from Max now. And after I read this verse from Max vocab, 
all the stuff you quoted to me from Paul is going to be nullified. And I said, well, who, 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 who wrote this verse in Acts? It's going to nullify everything Paul said. And he said, Paul. So I said, Paul's going to nullify Paul? Yeah. He got more understanding later in life. He's a work in progress like all of us. When he wrote Galatians, he said some messed up stuff. But he respected the law more at the end. True, true story. This is the kind of stuff you'll get. Now, when people do that in a joking way, sometimes I'll say, thank you very much for saying that because now you've admitted to us all that your theology doesn't agree with the Bible. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to kick out Paul. You know? But once you kick out Paul, it's because you're saying, he's wrong, I'm right, therefore I judge him. <laughs> Paul saw Jesus on the Damascus Road, people. He got caught up to the third heaven. He wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament letters. He hung out with Peter, and they gave him the right hand of fellowship. What are you doing, man? You just got YouTube. Galatians 3, verse 22. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So that the promise might be given to those who keep the law. So that the promise might be given to those who are sons and daughters of Abraham physically. No, to those who believe. Verse 23. But before faith came. Now, this is not saying people didn't have faith before. What it's saying is before the full manifestation of the reality that we're saved by grace through faith was expressed in the person, work, and ministry of Jesus Christ and the subsequent apostles. So that's Mosaic Law days. Here's the situation we were in. That's what he's talking about. Before faith came, we were held in custody under the law. If you've ever had handcuffs on, not a fun experience. The law's two handcuffs. You're held in custody under the law. That's what he's saying there being shut up for the coming faith to be revealed. But when faith comes, free. And the Bible literally says we are not under law, but we're under grace. The Bible literally says that in Romans. Look at verse 24. Therefore the law has become our tutor unto Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. So a couple different metaphors for the law. One's like a, a guard, like a, almost like holding you in prison in a way. Because you're you, it, it tells you what to do, but you're not empowered to keep it because the spirit has not been given yet. And Jesus Christ's work is not there for you to look at and see. And now it is we're in a much better position than Old Testament saints even. But the law tutored us. It leads us to Christ. It's it's like getting you there. But when Jesus comes, the training wheels come off and we don't go backwards. Why? Because we're made right, justified by faith. Faith means we trust in God for his promises. That's what it's saying. To all you people who are like, yeah, I believe in God, cool, but that's not what this is talking about. It's not saying faith in God existing. This is saying trust in God for his promise that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose the third day, and that's how your sins are forgiven. But now that faith has come, verse 25, we are no longer under a tutor. In the metaphor, what's the tutor? The law. So he just said we're no longer under a tutor. Well, what's the tutor? The law. And if you don't understand who Jesus is, you won't understand the law's design because you won't understand the real thing it's supposed to do is be a big arrow to Jesus. And he's saying, I fulfill the law. So he allows them to stand in that way because the law's purpose will be served. And he's literally going to keep it himself perfectly. Every single thing that the law said do, Jesus did. He kept it utterly perfectly. And that's why we see it makes sense. It's a whole other thing, though, to understand Jesus is God. Because if he's human, he's not going to be able to do that. But he keeps it perfectly. But then... He does it on our behalf. That's the beauty. So there's a sense in which we're saved by the law or saved by works. But it's Jesus' works. You understand? It's his works. It's his law keeping in a sense. So Christ here is addressing, clarifying his goal in relationship to the, to the scriptures. This is part of his messianic mission. 
I didn't come to abolish it, but I came to fulfill it. And notice again the contrast. And let's talk about the word fulfill here. This is the theological definition of what he means when he says fulfill. Fulfill means I will bring about its intended and ultimate purpose. If you want to make it shorter, bring about its intended purpose. So what it's supposed to do. Now that definition can be a natural definition for fulfill, first of all. Second of all, it's contextually driven by what Jesus shows us here. It's a verb, plerosi, plerosi. It's what's called a purpose infinitive. So he's telling you why here. And it's commonly used, this verb, plerosi, that's translated fulfill, in Matthew's uh, fulfillment quotations. He, Matthew has a formula. He'll say, this thing happened in Jesus' life, just like it was written about in the Old Testament, thus fulfilling the prophecy. Born of a virgin, fulfilling the prophecy. Matthew does this because he's showing that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. Now, that's the idea with fulfill. And some of the prophecies Jesus fulfills are kind of weird. A big one, a great one that you might think about that's very literal Micah 5 2 says the Messiah will need to be born in Bethlehem. Where is Jesus born? Bethlehem. You see what I'm saying? Others are different. When you know Jesus had to go hide in Egypt, you guys know that to run from Herod, right? And they come back out in Israel. Matthew says, this fulfills the prophecy out of Egypt. I have called my son. When you go to Hosea 11 and 1, where the prophecy is. It's not a prophecy about the Messiah. It's God talking about his people, Israel. He's saying, out of Egypt, I've called my son. He's just talking about Israel. It's like a descriptor of them. Well, how's that a prophecy? What this shows is the idea of fulfilling is deeper than we usually under understand. We usually think on this date, now it's fulfilled. The Bible's way it pictures Jesus fulfilling Old Testament law is more than just law. It's narrative, meaning the history of Israel even points towards Jesus' ministry. So just like Israel came out of Egypt, my son in the sense of my nation, God's literal son, and by that, of course, we don't mean there was a consort. We mean father, son, permanent, eternal, metaphysical, ontological relationship. The son came out of Egypt. So fulfill means to fill up and give the full intended meaning. So when you think of fulfill, think to fill full. Do you guys see what I'm saying? It's a cup. When Christ fulfills the scripture, the full intended meaning is poured out. It's now filled full. And that goes with every single thing that happens in the Bible. And that's why Jesus could walk with his disciples and say, Here's how I fulfilled this. So this is filling up God's purposes in redemptive history. This uses something called typology. We're going to get a little bit into that next week. But typology shows through historical patterns being repeated that the Old Testament prepares the way for Christ. It anticipates him. It points to him. It leads up to him. God's purpose expressed in scriptures reached their culmination, though, in the coming of Christ. This word Matthew uses 17 times and a word similar to leo three times, meaning it's a gospel of fulfillment. Now, with that in mind, we find out the examples he gives. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 21, Jesus is going to contrast his teaching with Moses. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. Now, I'm going to stop there because a common interpretation of this is people will say, Jesus was just properly explaining Moses, meaning the rabbis got it all wrong, but Jesus is going to fix it up. That's partially true. But notice, you shall not murder. Is that a messed up rabbinical saying? That's the Ten Commandments, bro. That's the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. That's not rabbis messing up the law with tradition. He's saying, you've heard this said, 
like in the synagogue when the Torah is read, don't murder. Which he is just going to say, now you can murder. Purge. First century version, right? No, that's not what he's saying. But this is the law of Moses. But he's saying, I got more than that. Because the new covenant is a higher standard. Law keepers think it's a lower standard. It's not. Watch this. When I say law keepers, I mean people who push Old Testament laws away of life. Not that they really keep it. Look at verse 22. But I say to you, he's literally saying, this was in Moses, but this is me. I'm a new lawgiver. Everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin. Whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and they're remembering that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and be thrown into prison. Now, what? Jesus is saying you couldn't murder people. Yeah, that's true. But I'm telling you, you can't even hate people. You can't be calling them names. And yes, there's a seed of that in you shall not murder. But it doesn't literally say that. It just says don't murder. And that's why some people go around, well, I mean, I, I didn't kill him. I wanted to kill you know, I did, but I didn't kill. I just, you know, I said this word, but I didn't kill. Right? But Jesus is saying, here's a higher standard. Here's what Moses gave you. And that's right. He's not contradicting it. He's saying, but here's what it's really all about. And guess what? Jesus did this in his life. Now, there's some hyperbole in here. That means exaggeration for a point. There's some hyperbole in here. If you look at some of you, you're like, wait, if I call someone a fool, am I going to hell? Well, Jesus himself called Pharisees fools. So there's also a contextual element. But what it's doing, it's progressing from murder into deeper things such as hatred and insults. This is an advance. This is an extension of Moses. This is, this is even an addition so when we say under the law of Christ, this is what we're talking about. Otherwise, what do you do with this? Now, because you can pick up books. I got a bag full of them. People will say, that's not right. Here's how we to interpret it. But I think this is the most plain, commonsensical, honest view of what is happening in these passages. Matthew 5, 27 to 28. You have heard it said you should not commit adultery. Now watch this. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then he goes on and talks about how to deal with it. Huh. So he goes from a prohibition to adultery to a prohibition against lust. Do you guys see that? So there's a parallel to the previous case. This is an advance. Jesus is giving his followers a higher law. A more internal law. And guess what? If you don't do those things, you won't do the others. Because all sin starts here. Eve first looked and said, that looks good, before she ever took a bite. Do you see? Watch this. Now notice I got first, second, and then third antithesis. What that means is simply Jesus on one hand says this, and then he goes on the other hand this. He's saying, you heard, but I say. That's what that idea there means. 31 to 32. This one is basically an abrogation where he cancels out or restricts something. Watch this. Now it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, now he goes on to the next one. Now, this is tight. This is tight. This has to do with permission and instructions for divorce in the ancient world. Because what would happen is they would come up with all kinds of reasons for why divorce was allowed. Basically, if your wife in any way displeased you, you could give her a certificate of divorce. And it was usually in the man's court or control, most part, in the ancient world. That's why it's in this language. So he's not just deepening this. He's not just extending this. He's not just properly interpreting this. He's getting at the real intent because the mosaic intent here is to prevent hasty divorce. But he rescinds 
the open permission that Moses did allow and forbids it, tightens it up. There is a parallel to this. In Mark 10, there was a discussion about marriage, and this was brought to Jesus' attention, this question, and I want to show you what he says. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of a divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote for you this commandment. So it's a commandment in the Old Testament. But notice, it has to do with the condition of the people. It's not an ideal, perfect state yet. Jesus is saying, because of the hardness of your heart. And then he goes on to say, but that's not how it was supposed to be from creation. Verse 6, but from the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. This is hard. This is serious. So there, basically, you have Moses acknowledging something, but not instituting it in the sense God, uh, Moses wasn't like, hey, let's start divorcing each other. It was already happening. And so basically, a less than ideal practice is regulated. There's similar things in the Old Testament, such as with slavery, such as with captives of war and things like that. When you go through and read, there's hard laws to deal with in there in our modern context. This helps us a little bit, but we got to go on because we only got a few more minutes left. Fourth antithesis, Matthew 5, 33 through 34. I'm just going to have to tell you what happens here. There's a prohibition of perjury in Leviticus. Jesus goes from that to a prohibition of oaths. Now, I believe there's some hyperbole in there as well, but he does forbid what the older law allowed. It's not just a mere exposition of the older law, and he's regulating what the oaths in the Old Testament were trying to ensure, which is honesty. This is what he's trying to accomplish here when he makes the older law obsolete because he says, hey, let your yes be yes and your no be no. They're saying, keep your word, basically. Last one, Matthew 5, 38 through 39. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. By the way, that's fair because in the Old Testament, in other uh, cultures, you could get over punished for something. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is, a, is a, a, a thing where the punishment fits the crime. It's saying there must be balance in the judgment that's meted out. So it sounds harsh, but it's actually fair. Do you understand? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's Old Testament law. It's a principle. It's not going to be over. It's got to fit it. It's called lex talionis. That's a term they came up with it. Jesus proceeds from lex talionis to non-resistance. What he's saying is, my followers are going to be willing to suffer personal insults. They're not always going to do an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. Because watch this. Look what he says. I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to see you and take your tunic, let him have your garment also. Suffering personal insults. Now, this must be balanced with other scriptures. We could do a whole teaching on why we do believe the Bible allows for self-defense. But what is this? I think the best interpretation is to understand the slap as a backhand slap. Because turning your cheek would mean now they go this way. It's an insult, but it's not causing bodily injury that is permanent or overly harmful. Because if you notice, these are all personal injuries in a way, personal insults. You see what I'm saying? A minor that's not minor, but this isn't someone attacking your wife or uh, kidnapping your children. You see what I'm saying? These are minor things. And he's saying, my sufferers, my, my followers, they're not going to do an eye for an eye and a, to a tooth for tooth. They're going to be willing to suffer personal insult on my behalf. And guess what? Jesus did that in his own life, didn't he? On our behalf. So he very severely restricts the use of retaliation. He does a sixth one. Where he talks about, you can't hate your enemy, you got to love them. That's Matthew 5. Let me just summarize this up. We're done here. If you look at this list, you'll see in each of these cases, Jesus gives something different than what's there. It doesn't contradict it, though. 
So this is sort of our model. When we approach any Old Testament law, we try to approach it the same way. What's the intent behind this? We imitate its intent through the lens of Christ and up the anony. The standard is always going to go up. Bible doesn't tell us how to do this with every single law, though. But as those who are under the law of Christ, we use biblical wisdom with the spirit empowered and the community to take basically take a step-by-step -step basis with these. Now, that's messy in a sense, but the question is, is that what the Bible teaches? I would say that it is. And this works because Jesus is the new and better Moses. He's the new and better lawgiver. He's greater than Moses, and therefore his words are greater than Moses' law as we follow the law of Christ. With that, let's pray. I'll be up here to take questions because we got to get out. Dear Lord, thank you, God, for this today, your word. We know we've grown with wisdom here, but we also know we've got a lot more questions. God, protect us from error and people trying to trick and fool us and get false titles. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the cross, and let us, I pray, follow the law of Christ in a new and improved way tonight and for the rest of our Christian walk in Jesus' name. Amen.